Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I am Nicole and I live here in India. And tonight I am here to do the second part of a two part reaction to Swami Vivekananda's 1839 speech in Chicago. This was a long, long time ago, obviously. You guys know that. And I have remarked on my first video that was really amazing that, I mean, the quality of this audio is fabulous. It's really like I could be listening to him speaking just yesterday. So um, we have left off um, half, almost halfway through the uh, the audio um, or the recording, and we're going to go ahead and start from just a few seconds before we left off um, in the, the first part. So let's go ahead and continue. If you haven't already um, given me a like and given me a subscribe, please consider doing that. That is the easiest way to support me and my channel and to let me know that you're here, and I really do appreciate it. So like, like, subscribe, and let's go. And what is his nature? He's everywhere, the pure and formless one, the almighty and the all merciful. Thou art our father, thou art our mother, thou art our beloved friend, thou art the source of all strength, give us strength. Thou art he that beareth the burdens of the universe. Help me bear the little burden of this life. Thus sang the rishis of the Vedas. And how to worship him? Through love. He is to be worshipped as the one beloved, dearer than everything in this and the next life. This is the doctrine of love declared in the Vedas. And let us see how it is fully developed and taught by Krishna, whom the Hindus believe to have been God incarnate on earth. He taught that a man ought to live in this world like a lotus leaf, which grows in water, but is never moistened by water. So a man ought to live in the world, his heart to God and his hands to work. It is good to love God for hope of reward in this or the next world, but it is better to love God for love's sake. One of the disciples of Krishna, the then emperor of India, was driven from his kingdom by his enemies and had to take shelter with his queen in a forest in the Himalayas. And there, one day, the queen asked him how it was that he, the most virtuous of men, should suffer so much misery. Yudhishthira answered, Behold, my queen, the Himalayas, how grand and beautiful they are. I love them. They do not give me anything, but my nature is to love the grand, the beautiful. Therefore, I love them. Similarly, I love the Lord. He is the source of all beauty, of all sublimity. He is the only object to be loved. The Hindu does not want to live upon words and theories. If there are existences beyond the ordinary, sensuous existence, he wants to come face to face with them. If there is a soul in him which is not matter, if there is an all-merciful universal soul, he will go to him direct. He must see him, and that alone can destroy all doubts. So. The best proof a Hindu sage gives about the soul, about God, is, I have seen the soul, I have seen God. And that is the only condition of perfection. The Hindu religion does not consist in struggles and attempts to believe a certain doctrine or dogma, but in realizing, not in believing, but in being and becoming. Thus, the whole object of their system is by constant struggle to become perfect, to become divine, to reach God and see God. And this reaching God, seeing God, becoming perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect, constitutes the religion of the Hindus. And what becomes of a man when he attains perfection? He lives a life of bliss infinite. He enjoys infinite and perfect bliss, having obtained the only thing in which man ought to have pleasure, namely God, and enjoys the bliss with God. So far, all the Hindus are agreed. This is the common religion of all the sects of India. But then, perfection is absolute, and the absolute cannot be two or three. It cannot have any qualities. It cannot be an individual. And so, when a soul becomes perfect and absolute, it must become one with Brahma. And it would only realize the Lord as the perfection, the reality of its own nature and existence, the existence, absolute, knowledge, 
absolute and bliss absolute. We have often and often read this called the losing of individuality and becoming a stock or a stone. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. I tell you, it is nothing of the kind. If it is happiness to enjoy the consciousness of this small body, it must be greater happiness to enjoy the consciousness of two bodies, the measure of happiness increasing with the consciousness of an increasing number of bodies, the aim, the ultimate of happiness being reached when it would become a universal consciousness. Therefore, to gain this infinite universal individuality, this miserable little prison individuality must go. Then alone can death cease when I am one with life. Then alone can misery cease when I am one with happiness itself. Then alone can all error cease when I am one with knowledge itself. And this is the necessary scientific conclusion. Science has proved to me that physical individuality is a delusion, that really my body is one little continuously changing body in an unbroken ocean of matter. And Advaita, or unity, is the necessary conclusion with my other counterpart, soul. Science is nothing but the finding of unity. As soon as science would reach perfect unity, it would stop from further progress, because it would reach the goal. Thus, chemistry could not progress farther when it would discover one element out of which all others could be made. Physics would stop when it would be able to fulfill its services in discovering one energy of which all the others are but manifestations. And the science of religion become perfect when it would discover him who is the one life in a universe of death, him who is the constant basis of an ever-changing world, one who is the only soul of which all souls are but delusive manifestations. Thus is it, through multiplicity and duality, that the ultimate unity is reached. Religion can go no farther. This is the goal of all science. All science is bound to come to this conclusion in the long run. Manifestation and not creation is the word of science today. And the Hindu is only glad that what he has been cherishing in his bosom for ages is going to be taught in more forcible language and with further light from the latest conclusions of science. Descend we now from the aspirations of philosophy to the religion of the ignorant. The tree is known by its fruits. When I have seen amongst them that are called idolaters, men, the like of whom, in morality and spirituality and love, I have never seen anywhere, I stop and ask myself, can sin beget holiness? Superstition is a great enemy of man, but bigotry is worse. Why does a Christian go to church? Why is the cross holy? Why is the face turned toward the sky in prayer? Why are there so many images in the Catholic Church? Why are there so many images in the minds of Protestants when they pray? My brethren, we can no more think about anything without a mental image than we can live without breathing. By the law of association, the material image calls up the mental idea and vice versa. This is why the Hindu uses an external symbol when he worships. He will tell you it helps to keep his mind fixed on the being to whom he prays. After all, how much does omnipresence mean to almost the whole world? It stands merely as a word, a symbol. Has God superficial area? If not, when we repeat that word omnipresent, we think of the extended sky or of space. That is all. If a man can realize his divine nature with the help of an image, would it be right to call that a sin? Nor, even when he has passed that stage, should he call it an error? To the Hindu, man is not traveling from error to truth, but from truth to truth, from lower to higher truth. To him, all the religions, from the lowest fetishism to the highest absolutism, mean so many attempts of the human soul to grasp and realize the infinite, each determined by the conditions of its birth and association, and each of these marks a stage of progress. And every soul is a young eagle soaring higher and higher, 
gathering more and more strength till it reaches the glorious sun. Every other religion lays down certain fixed dogmas and tries to force society to adopt them. It places before society only one quote which must fit Jack and John and Henry all alike. If it does not fit John or Henry, he must go without a coat to cover his body. The Hindus have discovered that the absolute can only be realized or thought of or stated through the relative. And the images, crosses and crescents are simply so many symbols, so many pegs to hang spiritual ideas on. It is not that this help is necessary for everyone, but those that do not need it have no right to say that it is wrong, nor is it compulsory in Hinduism. One thing I must tell you, idolatry in India does not mean anything horrible. It is not the mother of harlots. On the other hand, it is the attempt of undeveloped minds to grasp high spiritual truths. The Hindus have their faults, they sometimes have their exceptions, but mark this, they are always for punishing their own bodies and never for cutting the throats of their neighbors. If the Hindu fanatic burns himself on the fire, he never lights the fire of inquisition. And even this cannot be laid at the door of his religion any more than the burning of witches can be laid at the door of Christianity. To the Hindu then, the whole world of religions is only a traveling, a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal. Every religion is only evolving a god out of the material man. And the same God is the inspirer of all of them. Why then are there so many contradictions? They are only apparent, says the Hindu. The contradictions come from the same truth, adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures. It is the same light coming through glasses of different colors. And these little variations are necessary for purposes of adaptation. But in the heart of everything, the same truth reigns. The Lord has declared to the Hindu in his incarnation as Krishna, I am in every religion as a thread through a string of pearls. Wherever thou seest extraordinary holiness and extraordinary power raising and purifying humanity, know thou that I am there. And what has been the result? I challenge the world to find throughout the whole system of Sanskrit philosophy any such expression as that the Hindu alone will be saved and not others. Says Vyasa, we find perfect men even beyond the pain of our caste and creed. One thing more, how then can the Hindu, whose whole fabric of thought centers in God, believe in Buddhism, which is agnostic, or in Jainism, which is atheistic? The Buddhists or the Jains do not depend upon God, but the whole force of their religion is directed to the great central truth in every religion, to evolve a god out of man. They have not seen the father, but they have seen the son. And he that hath seen the son hath seen the father also. This, brethren, is a short sketch of the religious ideas of the Hindus. The Hindu may have failed to carry out all his plans, but if there is ever to be a universal religion, it must be one which will have no location in place or time, which will be infinite like the God it will preach, and whose sun will shine upon the followers of Krishna and of Christ, on saints and sinners alike, which will not be Brahminic or Buddhistic, Christian or Mohammedan, but the sum total of all these, and still have infinite space for development, which in its Catholicity will embrace in infinite arms and find a place for every human being from the lowest groveling savage, not far removed from the brute, to the highest man towering by the virtues of his head and heart, almost above humanity. It will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity, which will recognize divinity in every man and woman, and whose whole scope, whose whole force will be centered in aiding humanity to realize its own true divine nature. May he, who is the Brahma of the Hindus, the Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Buddha of the Buddhists, the Jehovah of the Jews, the Father in Heaven of the Christians, give strength to you to carry out your noble idea. The star arose in the east. It traveled steadily towards the west, sometimes dimmed and sometimes effulgent. 
Still, it made a circuit of the world, and now it is again rising on the very horizon of the east, the borders of the Sanpo, a thousandfold more effulgent than it ever was before. Well, that's it. Um, so we finished it, and wow, I am a little kind of blown away by what he said. So initially, the first twelve minutes or so, uh, and just a few minutes of that, but the last few minutes of part one, um, which uh, I can link here, um, he had talked about um, rebirth and um, the. Uh, the number of lives that um, uh, people may have. And I did say that I didn't necessarily agree with that. And, or, you know, it's all about what we are, what we're growing up with, right? And how, what we learn. And I, I, I can't say that it's not true or that it's not what happens, but that's not in, I think, in my heart and what I believe. But what, what I heard now was, I mean, it, it was interesting about how I felt it sounded so, it sounded very Christian. Um, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it sounds Hindu as well. That's the interesting part is that so many of these, you know, th these religions, they have um, very common origins. And I know that even Jesus in, in India is considered to be, you know, a holy man. So, you know, I have said for many years that my belief um, is that, I, I, and I do, I believe that there are many paths to God, whether it's Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism, uh, Islam, whatever is your path to God, you're on a path to God. And that's amazing and beautiful and should be respected. And so, but what he, you know, you know, what he was saying about, you know, the father and the son and um, these different things. And he was speaking about the incarnation of Krishna, but he could have been speaking about the father and, you know, and Jesus as the incarnation in, in Christianity. So I found it to be very, very interesting in how, you know, it could have been a priest seeing those things when, you know, it, it obviously wasn't. It just is, uh, it's it's interesting how many things they have, they all have in common. So this was such an interesting uh, watch or listen, and I really do appreciate uh, the uh, our recommendation. It was, um, wow, it was really great. I, I'm hoping that I can find some more things to, to listen um, from uh, Swami Vivekananda. So if you like the reaction, please give a like, please give a subscribe. And as always, I love you and bye-bye.